This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Clary. I'm the chair of the curriculum committee at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute here at UC San Diego. I'm also the coordinator for this afternoon's lecture. We are very pleased to welcome Professor Carl Gerth to the Osher Institute. Professor Gerth is an internationally acknowledged expert on Chinese consumerism. consumerism. He received his PhD from Harvard University and taught at Oxford University until 2013 when he accepted the show fellowship endowed chair in modern Chinese studies and a professorship of history here at UC San Diego. Professor Gerth is going to talk to us today about the problems and opportunities associated with the rise of consumerism in China. Uh, his most recent book is called As China Goes, So Goes the World. How Chinese Consumers Are Transforming Everything. It's been translated into a number of different languages and is widely uh, acclaimed. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gerth to Osher. Uh, thank you, Steve, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me. I'm new to San Diego and new to UCSD, so it's a really great opportunity to explore different parts of the campus uh, and the city by doing this. Uh, I'm also appreciative that all of you came out here today. As Steve mentioned, I lived in Oxford for seven years prior, before, prior to coming here, and if I were giving a talk in the afternoon on a day like this, uh, I don't think there would be quite as many people in here. But <laughs> here, here in San Diego, we have a special name for this day, uh, Thursday. <laughs> um, so, right, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, do we want China to be more like us? The first question we might ask is, well, what is us? What does it mean to be us? The bit of us that I want to talk about isn't the bit of us that we often see in the newspapers. Uh, that is, is uh, us as in, very dem as in democratic. Uh, so do we want China to be more democratic? Sure. That's not a uh, really contestable uh, question. But do we want uh, China to be more like us that I'm going to talk about uh, today is us as a consumer-driven economy and society. Uh, that photo is a photo of a woman looking at a Barbie, uh, at Barbies, at a Barbie store. Uh, well, it's now a defunct Barbie store in Shanghai. And I use that as what it, emblematic of what it means to be a consumer contemplating the various Barbie options. The point of my talk of today is to talk about all this different information we get uh, about China and about how to prioritize it and make sense of it. If I do my job successfully this early afternoon, um, you will at least have my interpretation of how to make sense of all the data that we get about China. You're not meant to actually look at any of those uh, slides up there. That, that for me is just an illustration of data overload about China. So much different information about China coming in, but what are the drivers? What are the important things uh, that are going on in China? And how can we make sense of it? How can we fit various bits of data that we get into this larger picture of what's going on there? And I think we can best do that by contemplating uh, the origins of how I get my first haircut. Um, I think I can encapsulate what it's like in China and what the changes of, in China have been by my experience getting haircuts in China. Uh, when I first went to China in 1986, I wouldn't say this was exactly how I got my haircut. I think my mom was slightly more gentle than the uh, state-owned uh, barber shop that I went to to get my haircut. Uh, but the quality was probably, and the outcome was uh, probably roughly the same. It was that low quality sort of a haircut that you would have gotten in China up through the mid-1980s. Uh, flash forward a couple of decades, and now we see that China has changed tremendously from the land, you could say, of bad 
haircuts uh, to the land where there is a haircut boutique place in major cities virtually on every corner. Um, those statistics at the bottom are just for me or a reminder for me. Once upon a time, beauty, beauty industry, haircut industry was a marginal part of the Chinese economy. Now it's in a very important uh, part, fifth largest industry in China. Once upon a time, it was hard to get a decent haircut or a haircut at all unless you went to one of these state-owned shops uh, uh, and they were only open banker's hours. Now you have 1.6 million plus hair salons, uh, department stores and boutiques all catering to people's personal appearance. So this personal appearance then is gone, as I've said, from the land of roughly quality of haircut that I got when I was a child uh, to that image on the right. Um, and I think that this kind of encapsulates the transformation that, I've gone, uh, uh, that I'm going to talk about today. That once upon a time, China was a pretty uh, bad place to be a consumer, and, uh, and now it's not. Um, I'm not just going to describe that for the sake of describing it. I'm going to describe it for the sake of understanding what are the driving forces behind all of those changes emanating out of China that also affect us over here as well. Uh, so that's just one way to wrap your, your head, uh, your haircut, around uh, this sort of transformation. So the larger issue, the larger thing that I'm trying to do then is replace one set of concerns that we have about China, one set of concerns that pop, pops up every day, every other day, at least once a week, one of those on the left will be in the newspapers. We'll hear stuff about China related to Chinese military budgets. I remember when I made this slide a year or so ago, uh, there was all this talk about China having stealth bombers. So there's lots of stuff about China is spending so much on its military, it's going to catch up with us. Ooh, be scared, that sort of uh, thing. Uh, that is one round of news cycles. Uh, we hear about Chinese soaring energy demands and competition for uh, fossil fuels. Uh, we persistently hear about human rights uh, and democracy. I'm sure everyone at any given time, maybe we can tell by generation which Chinese dissident you remember the name of. Ai Weiwei, I guess, would be uh, the current one. Uh, likewise, we hear stuff about Chinese uh, uh, currency re-evaluations or lack thereof, that somehow that they're keeping their currency artificially uh, low priced, so that makes their exports competitive and that we're at a competitive disadvantage from that. Again, what I'm going through here is this kind of generic stories that we hear about over and over again in China. And what I want to try to do today is say these stories are all important and interesting, uh, but I want to substitute a different story um, uh, uh, on the right. Uh, as an explanation of what I think helps tie together all of these issues as well as many other issues. And that issue is this transformation of China moving away from this uh, production-oriented, produce as much as possible. Most of us are old enough to remember the day in which a state would measure its success based on stuff like uh, steel output. So moving away from a productivist or a production-oriented ori um, economy and society where the obsession was with producing, 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 uh, toward a more consumer-driven economy. What we'd see as we replace that one set of uh, pastiche of images and news stories about China uh, with the story on the right of China transforming itself into a consumer-driven economy and society um, is these radical transformations in everyday life both in China and what I'm going to try to convince you of as well is this, this isn't just a story for people who are interested in China but these things going on in China influence all sorts of things uh, that you may not be aware of uh, here in the United States and the rest of the world. And that, I believe, that that transformation, the effort to replace China as production orientation with a consumer-driven economy much like ours, hence the answer to that original question, do we want them to be more like us? Do we want them to be a more consumer-oriented economy and society? Why yes, why no? And why does this particular issue, why do I argue that this particular issue is the driving issue behind so many of the stories that we see coming out of China? Um, I want to suggest then, maybe this is in a nutshell, the kind of contradiction uh, between why it's nice and why it's not so nice, what's going on in China. The one side uh, uh, on the left there is represented by choice. That's what we associate with a consumer society, that you get to pick the kind of car you drive, the sort of place you get your hair cut to continue with that theme, uh, all these other things which are really nice. Uh, so don't want to begrudge the Chinese the opportunity to have tea or clean water. Uh, but what are the consequences uh, I want to talk about today, uh, both for China itself, as represented by the most obvious one, um, extreme amounts of pollution, um, as well as the implications for uh, the rest of the world as well. 
Um, I think there's an international consensus that's continued on for a couple of decades now. I stopped bothering updating these quotes, but you can get these quotes pretty easily. And these are quotes both from Chinese as well as uh, foreign, both business leaders and politicians. There is a consensus that what the world needs is for China to move away from this obsession with exporting, exporting, exporting ad infinitum forever uh, and relying on us as consumers to Chinese themselves uh, creating domestic demand, not only for its own products, but from the products of the rest of the world, including ours. So that consensus then says that what the world needs, and this was especially acute after 2008, was the Chinese to do their part of consuming more. Uh, so these quotes, which we don't really need, uh, need to read, are, are, are just illustrations of, of that, that point, that it doesn't matter whether it's Chinese business leaders or Western business leaders, uh, Chinese politicians, Western politicians. The consensus is that China needs to move from being a production-oriented economy, one, an export-oriented economy, to one that, that relies on pushing its consumers, getting its consumers uh, to drive economic growth not only in its country, uh, uh, but ideally for the rest of the world too. So the question I want to ask then is, uh, can China save the world, uh, become more like us, uh, and do so w without uh, destroying it at the same time? Will they spend enough uh, to rescue the world economy? Will they replace the overspent, overleveraged American and Western European consumers and start to buy? Um, we've, uh, I'll give the example of cars uh, momentarily of how they are saving Detroit um, on the one hand, but what are they doing to the, uh, the global um, environment on the other? What are the implications, for instance, of Chinese driving as many cars, switching from vegetable to meat-based diets, uh, taking as many plane rides as we take to go on vacation? In short, then, what are the trade-offs, both positive and negative, of China becoming a society much like ours, becoming a consumer-oriented economy? economy and a consumer-oriented society. Um, I suggest that uh, one way of looking at all of these uh, changes uh, I try to uh, approach in uh, that last book, which is a very autobiographical, it's almost shamefully autobiographical for an academic. You're supposed to usually hide the whole I bit, right? You're not supposed to include I in good academic writing. But I include stories the whole way through because I've witnessed most of this transformation, both from, as I said, the land of the bad haircut to the land of I wait until, my, uh, wait until I get to China before I get a haircut because the quality of the haircut and the scrubbing is uh much more thorough than anything I experienced here. Uh, so uh, uh, I, in this book, I try to uh, I grapple with this question my, myself. It was a very satisfying experience of like, how did this, this country go from that to this, and, and how did it do so quickly? So I try to take a lot of different topics and put them under one umbrella, that same driving umbrella of that transformation. So in this book, how could you possibly talk about stolen babies, um, uh, organ tourism, um, environmental degradation, uh, new rich in China and their spending habits, how could all of those fit under one umbrella? It's that same umbrella that I've been suggesting to you is the key to understanding these transformations in China. And that is that push uh, for China to move away from that production uh, obsession, that export obsession. Uh, toward a more consumer-driven economy and a society uh, organized around uh, more uh, consumption. So uh, the cars, uh, I'll give you the example of cars today because like that uh, haircut story that I told you, I think the story of cars and how China went from, from having no personal cars less than two decades ago to having the world's largest market for cars as well as being the world's largest manufacturer of cars. That little story, I think, encapsulates a lot of the transformations that we see across the board uh, in Chinese society and, and its economy. Uh, but let me briefly uh, give you a teaser or a hint at some of the other themes um, that we can talk about more in the, in the, the uh, discussion uh, section that we have after my uh, talk. The new rich gets at this uh, question of uh, who is wealthy in China? Who are these consumers, especially consumers at the top? Where did they get the money? Um, my thesis or the thing that I explore in that chapter is, um, where, whereas I think Americans seemingly have an endless toleration for uh, inequality, uh, what about in a socialist country that has a living memory of trying to build a more egalitarian country? How do they feel about the growing inequality in China? And my argument is that they have a love-hate relationship towards the rich. 
on the one hand, the rich represent the lifestyles that they want. So they, like me, you know, watch Chinese equivalents of lifestyles of the rich and famous. And it's, uh, it's nice to be in a crowd of over 18, 18 year olds who will get some of my references. <laughs> um, um, right, so on the one hand, the, that kind of lifestyle that they read about is a playbook for what kind of life they aspire to. On the other hand, there is a feeling in China that the fix is in. Uh, that the way you become rich isn't because you worked very hard, which may explain some of our uh, toleration of inequality, that you believe, well, those person worked so hard, they deserve to have a big house in La Jolla. <laughs> um, um, so uh, uh, what, how does that tension play out in China, that tension between, on the one hand, aspiring to be like those people, on the other hand, um, uh, feeling like those people uh, got there not from hard work, but because the fix is in. Um, I spoke to a group of uh, Chinese college students, and their number one issue wasn't when will China become democratic, what seems to be our number one issue. Their number one issue was I managed to test my way in through all of the, overcome all these hurdles to get into the best university uh, in China, but when I graduate, my prospects, unless my daddy and mommy are, are uh, very connected, my prospects aren't especially good. Why is that? That second question, and I was afraid people in the Q&A would ask me about Hong Kong. I don't really follow political issues that uh, quick, uh, closely, but I thought there may be some similarities in how I would answer that to how I would answer a, a question about the relationship between Taiwan and China. Um, I, I think, and my idealistic Taiwanese friends don't like this answer, I think that the uh, Taiwanese uh, business leaders um, are making so much money from the China market that the possibilities or the push or the impulse uh, for uh, independence isn't what it once was. Uh, moreover, I think uh, the Taiwan, th that, the, uh, that the capital and know-how of Taiwanese managers helps explain how China was able to transform itself so quickly. That's one of maybe the big questions of the late 20th and tw 21st century. It's not why did China shift from this production orientation to a consumer orientation? Why did it decide to rely on exports to America? Uh, because there are so many other other models of success in East Asia. The question is, why was it able to do it so quickly? And I think pointing to uh, overseas Chinese uh, in Hong Kong and Southeast Asia and in Taiwan and the investment that they took to China, the business know-how they, they took to China helps explain it and it helps tie China and Taiwan together in ways that make some uh, political push towards independence a lot harder to pull off. A couple of middle chapters that I won't talk about that much because they sound so boring are yet fascinating to me. If, if I'm, if I'm talk, telling you that the most important issue is this push towards consumerism in China, then the natural sort of question should be, well, what do you mean by, what exactly is consumerism? I have a vague idea. I go to the store, I buy stuff, I'm a consumer. But what I mean by consumerism is the production, the mass production of the same kind of thing, uh, the circulation of those kinds of things, and people's creation of their individual identities around those things. So if you drink Coke versus Mountain Dew, presumably, I I don't know, I'm no longer a teenager. You communicate different things about yourself by picking one product rather than another product. That is all premised on the idea that th there's a Coke everywhere, a McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, everywhere. One of the things we see in this period of China as it moves from land of bad haircut to land of very good haircut is this movement away from mom and pop shops in a heterogeneous, a very differentiated uh, consumer marketplace where what you buy in one part of China is radically different from what you buy in another part of China towards a mass standardization across the entire country. So you can have McDonald's in one part of China China and McDonald's in a different part of China. You can have the same types of consumer experiences increasingly across at least uh, the Chinese urban landscape. So re retailing, which sounds like a boring business school topic at first, for me is not only about a boring business school topic, but also the possibility of having a unified consciousness, about having consumers identify the same desires across a very diverse landscape. Um, Branding consumer consciousness builds on what I had done earlier in my academic work, which is to look at Chinese efforts uh, to become not just a manufacturing superpower, but a branding superpower. In other words, not just doing the hard work of manufacturing Apple iPhones, but also owning brands like Apple iPhones or owning websites like Alibaba. Um, these are all this effort to move up the value chain so that it can still, uh, it can have another round of economic development. 
Uh, related to that is this, uh, is this issue of counterfeits in China. Maybe this is one of the top things we associate with consumers about why we wouldn't want to be a consumer in China. In that chapter, I talk about um, how, how difficult and unpleasant it is to be a consumer in China, uh, to go into a store and never know whether something that says it's something is actually that something. I think this is a very important topic to me for a couple of reasons, but it's directly related to that issue of consumerism and consciousness. If I'm trying to communicate to the world that I've made it because I drive a fancy car, but that fancy car has counterfeit brake parts in it, am I going to be willing to spend $100,000 for a Mercedes where I, where that explodes, um, that, that, uh, with brakes that explodes? You can, you, can, you can follow that issue across all these branded categories in which what you're buying when you buy a high-end brand, or any brand for that matter, rather than a generic, is a feeling of, of safety and certainty. Uh, this feeling has carried home, uh, I've carried this back from China. Uh, recently when I went to buy an antihistamine, I had the generic brand and I had the uh, Benadryl uh, brand. Uh, and, and once upon a time I used to gravitate towards the Benadryl brand because I'm like, well, 50 cents difference or whatever. I've made it in life. I can afford the guarantees. That I'm sure even though I, you know, probably coming from the exact same place, uh, I, I assume their quality control or whatever is better. But this new consciousness suggests that that's exactly what counterfeiters go after. They don't knock off the generics because that's not where the value is. And that's not where the additional uh, profit is. I think that's one of these issues I promised you that's not just an issue of what's going on in China, the undermining of capitalism, the undermining of consumer consciousness but those same counterfeits are getting into global supply chains. So in places like Africa, a very high percentage, over 50% of pharmaceuticals are counterfeit drugs. So maybe we have our borders, our borders carefully monitored, but don't count on it. Uh, so well, this, is, this also uh, pertains to one of the other themes that I'm sort of interested in. Uh, that is this theme that somehow China is down here in messy, complicated, undemocratic, uh, chaotic market land. We're up here in happy, perfect land, and China's slowly making its way that way. It'll eventually move there. It'll get its regulation right, all of that other kind of stuff. But my own, my own personal opinion uh, is that it's much more like this. We seem to be meeting somewhere in the middle. Our standards seem to be undermined, uh, whether we make the sacrifices for short-term profit or we just can't look in every bottle to make sure that it contains what it's supposed to uh, contain. Uh, this extreme market uh, uh, chapter is about the um, Chinese buying and selling of, um, of things that we think ought not be on the market and things that they, in the Mao period, heavily, in the Mao period from 1949 to 1976, heavily uh, suppressed. So things like prostitution, things like sales of babies, things like organ tourism, where you go and have your cornea replaced there because it's cheaper and, and maybe you can find donors, <laughs> willing or otherwise, to, to pro provide those uh, corneas. The reason that interests, interests me is there one reason why someone like me, why a historian like me is interested in consumerism is growing up in the Cold War era, at the end of the Cold War, we associated freedom with freedom in the marketplace. So I think China then poses some questions for us. Are they more free, than, are, are they more free if they can sell their kidneys and we can't? There are a lot of question, troubling questions about the emergence of extreme markets, about markets in China for things that you wouldn't see here or that you previously didn't see uh, that makes us wonder. And last, I'll talk about the environment implications when I talk about uh, cars. So what I want to do with the remaining amount of time that I have, um, the 35 minutes or so that I have, is to give you an example of all of this this stuff. If you're not that interested in cars, the same kind of story that I'm going to tell applies to many other industries in China as well, in advertising and web development like Alibaba. Uh, we can go through all whatever your pet topic is. So I think the transformation of China in the area of cars explains a lot of different sectors of its economy. Uh, and as we'll see, there are lots of global implications for all of those things. So the question is, how did China go from this land, which only a couple of decades ago saw 
saw just a few people like Deng Xiaoping there uh, riding in his troop review uh, have, who had access to cars. There were no private cars, uh, and China didn't manufacture very, uh, manufacture very many at all. Uh, most people had bicycles, right? China, land of bicycles. I, I suspect in the library there's any uh, number of old books published 50 plus years ago with that title, Land of Bicycles. How did it go from that to, as I said, China is the largest manufacturer as well as market for cars. They not only produce more than anybody else, but they also buy more than anybody else. Uh, when I wrote that book, when I finished the research for it just a couple of decades ago, they had just passed the United States. I think it was in 2009. They had just passed the United States. 2008 helped America dip a little bit in car sales. China shot ahead. And now they're, I mean, light years ahead. I think I, think I read this year 24, 25, 26 million units, and we're at like 14, 15. Um, so yeah, it's, it's um, gone from nothing to where all the profit centers are for uh, global car manufacturers. So wh how did this story take place? I think the one, there's one way to tell the story, uh, and that's all about uh, individual desire and the state withdrawal from the marketplace. Uh, by that I mean, once upon a time, the evil Chinese state said no private cars, so wo voila, there were no private cars. Uh, once the state got out of the way of regulating whether or not you could have a car or not, uh, then uh, DNA uh, took its course and people started to want and eventually buy cars. So if, if you pursue that explanation for why China went from having no cars to so many cars, you could think about all the individual reasons why, why we'd want a car and imagine the same and more applying to China. There's a whole status thing. Um, in the story, I tell, uh, in, sorry, in my book, I tell a story about a famous Chinese academic I know uh, in Shanghai who didn't need a car and didn't want a car, uh, but uh, he bought a new condo and in, he had a, a designated parking spot. And because he didn't have a car, his neighbors kept asking if, the, if he needed to borrow money, if everything was okay, if his job security was all right, whether his parents were all, you know, all those kind of things about what, well, how come this person doesn't have a car? He's a fancy professor at a fancy university. So there's the status and emulation and all of those, again, individual explanations for why once the big, bad, evil, highly regu regulatory state withdraws from regulating so many aspects of Chinese life, that nature can take its course and uh, just like everybody else in, in the car buying world, uh, China can pursue status, they can pursue safety, they can ride in air conditioning, uh, they can do a couple of things that are specific to China like having a car club. Uh, car clubs are where people um, who own cars go on little convoys, they take along their own uh, mechanic. Uh, it seems like a pretty smart idea to me, and go on these sort of group expeditions to, uh, to use their cars. So again, the one explanation if we're trying to explain this story of why China went from having bad haircut to lots of haircuts is all about this individual desire stuff. I want a better haircut. What's, what's the story? Typical academic, right? Take something simple and obvious and makes it more complicated. Um, so, but I, I want to argue that it's much more than individual choice. I want to look at the state role um, of uh, pushing people into cars. Uh, so uh, this, again, the illustrations are, I was, I was telling somebody up here beforehand that about five years ago I learned the joys of PowerPoint. The joys are you don't need notes. It's up there. And I, told, I, I challenged him to figure out which PowerPoints were for my sake, <laughs> for my memory's sake, and which were for your sake. So those people who can't see the fine print, you're not really meant to. Uh, you're supposed to take my word that there's a lot of different things beyond individual desire, beyond state withdrawal from the market and the market working its magic and suddenly everyone's having their desires filled. The one way I encapsulate the huge role of the state in pushing people into this new consumer economy and society, um, I can encapsulate with this. Private residences don't collapse and turn into asphalt roads on their own. Right? You don't have the magic of the marketplace creating roads for people to drive their new cars on. Uh, that, that requires a very uh, intrusive uh, state in order to have that, uh, in order to have roads even. So all, almost after, to my, in my opinion, everything else, all the other examples I give you are gravy when you contemplate that, that you need this powerful state uh, creating the kind of infrastructure in which ro cars are even possible, uh, let alone desirable. So I also put up some other changes in, re in the China in the last few decades. Uh, China has privatized a lot of its state-owned industri industries, uh, those enterprises, rather that's the SOE, state-owned enterprises. 
once upon a time, the best jobs in China were working for these state-owned enterprises in Chinese cities. Uh, if you had one of these jobs, uh, you didn't get a super big paycheck, but you got all sorts of other benefits. One of those benefits was housing. So you lived and worked in the same location. That was very common across China. You'd have these big gate, I mean, entire, I would say larger than blocks, blocks and blocks completely gated in, these own compounds, their own worlds, their own self-contained uh, little uh, units. Uh, well, that's no longer the case. Uh, now they've disbanded much, most um, of those state-owned enterprises and the housing that they uh, provided. Uh, so instead of having um, mixed-use centers of cities where you live and work in the same location, uh, you've kind of created central business districts with property values that make it prohibitively expensive for middle class and below to live there, and you've pushed those people out into other locations. I'm explaining them as an expl I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning all of this as an explanation for why you need cars. What are the state policies that are indirectly, in a moment I'll suggest directly, uh, pushing people into desiring or needing um, uh, automobiles? And what I'm suggesting in all of this is this idea that the, you know, it's the evil state has gotten out of the way and, and it's all uh, happening naturally on its own um, is, is a simplification, um, perhaps for a very specific ideological reason why we like to imagine the, the, this is all the marketplace. All human, you know, naturally doing doing things which come naturally. Where instead, what we see here uh, um, is the sta state uh, doing all sorts of things, creating these longer commutes, uh, shifting from having mixed use to having these central uh, business districts, uh, allowing land on the on the outskirts to turn into suburbs, building roads, allowing roads to be built uh, to those places. Um, the state can also play a role by um, uh, ordering state banks to lend for cars. It's a teeny part of the market, but it's an, it's an example of the sorts of things that the state can do uh, to push people into cars. It can lower tariffs. Um, uh, it can put money into these things. There's all sorts of ways, uh, again, which it can uh, push people into buying cars. But what I, what I think is the most important story, and the story that cuts across industries, is the role of the, um, of the, of the WTO and China's ascension to the WTO in 2001. In the early 1990s, China knew it was going to become a WTO member. It needed to become a WTO member because if it didn't, it would pay higher tariffs to get its exports into lots of different markets, including ours. So it would make them, say, less competitive compared to Mexico. So they were in this position where they had to join the WTO in order to have preferential trade uh, uh, treatment in order to continue to rely on exports for, uh, for its economic growth. Um, no problem there, but the other side of the story is what did it have to do in exchange for that? In exchange for getting preferential access for uh, all the stuff it's manufacturing, it also had to agree to lower its tariffs and lower all the different kinds of controls it had on its economy that made it hard for foreign investors, uh, foreign companies, uh, to buy up and control uh, specific aspects of the Chinese um, economy. Uh, again, this is the idea, uh, advertising agencies, supermarket chains, all of these kind of different industries, including uh, cars, are affected by the decision to join the WTO. What happens in my interpretation in the 1990s is that Chinese policymakers realize they have a very small window between the time they agree to join the WTO and when the tariffs begin to fall and, and their own uh, domestic manufacturers become severely uh, threatened by the consequences. So in that little window, it decides that it better create a car manufacturing industry, a competitive one, as quickly as possible. Um, otherwise, uh, it's game up. Those industries will be controlled permanently uh, by foreign multinationals. Um, so for me, that's the, the kind of um, explanation or most important explanation for why uh, China moves from becoming um, a, a, a country without cars to a country um, that is uh, increasingly dependent on them, not only to get to work, but also um, to, to grow their uh, um, economy. It's that role of the WTO. I like to suggest then that what uh, China, uh, what was done onto China through the WTO, pushing China, uh, creating conditions in which China was incentivized to go the car route, to build a car economy, to build a car society, <coughs> China is now doing onto others. One of the problems with Chinese manufacturing is they have massive overcapacity. They're making a lot more cars than they can possibly absorb. 
even with 25 million units. Uh, so they need to find other outlets. Sound familiar? This is what was done onto China, right? We had all this excess capacity here, same in Korea, uh, uh, Germany, and so on, and we need to find new markets uh, for uh, all of that capacity. Uh, China is now doing that um, <clears throat> in other countries. It hasn't uh, found the magic key other than buying brands, uh, other than buying well-known Swedish brands here um, in the United States and in Western Europe. It hasn't found a way of moving up that chain of creating cars that we, we desire. But it is doing that in Southeast Asia um, and Africa. It's, it, it's finding new markets for cars. And what I'm trying to suggest then is what we see going on in, in Africa and Southeast Asia. If we imagine China to be a doubling down on our commitment as an economy uh, and as a society to being organized around cars, uh, we see then China uh, through uh, both carrot and stick uh, creating the same. Uh, and now we see China then using its own leverage uh, throughout other parts of the world uh, to have them reorganize their um, e uh, e economies and societies around, around cars. So what I've, what I've been trying to argue with, argue with this example uh, is that it's not only a car, uh, car export industry, but it's also a car, uh, car culture. One of the things that defines me as an historian is I'm part of a group of historians that uh, look in, uh, instead of looking at production, so the Industrial Revolution being all about invention of stuff which allowed you to produce more, is instead uh, historians who say you can't assume demand. You can't assume that just because you could make a better mousetrap that someone would want to buy it. Uh, so I, I, I'm very interested in what creates demand, what creates consumers to want stuff in the first place. So in addition to just talking about the sort of environment in which Chinese uh, needed to be pushed, uh, needed cars, in, in which the government, Chinese government, needed people uh, to start buying uh, cars, I look at the ways uh, in which car culture is also introduced in China. Uh, all the stuff which would put my a uh, friend, for instance, in the position where he thought, I don't really need a car, um, but I'll get one anyway. And last time I was there, it was funny, because the first time we talked about this, he was like, I'm not going to get a car, public transportation, fine. The last time I was there, e even though he knows I cited him in the book, I don't think I used his name, um, you know, the last time I was there, we went on a road trip. And yeah, it was fun. And boy, was he proud to be in his Buick, uh, <laughs> driving around the countryside. And yeah, we went to places we couldn't otherwise access. And again, what I'm sort of suggesting, though, is uh, if you think of all the reason why we're, which we're, and we're committed to having cars, there are malls now in China. I, and again, this is the, the guy who had the bad haircut in China in 86 never thought he'd live long enough to imagine that there would be malls that I would need a car and a friend with a car to get to in China. Gated communities, weekend holidays, uh, not to mention really bad conditions for cyclists. You can go through all the kind of reasons why we drive and imagine those and others in China. So it's not not just as I've sort of said at first about uh, we need to move up the value chain and, and create a more competitive economy by having uh, cars, but it's also that demand has been created there. So if I were suggesting to you the reasons why China isn't going to somehow magically leave cars behind um, overnight, um, that's one of the things I would point to. Uh, gateway cars is my suggestion, as I've just made, that China is now doing through inexpensive exports what it did for so many other things, including in this country. It made possible for us to buy lots of other stuff which would have been prohibitively expensive before. It's doing that for cars in other parts of the world as well as in China. It's giving people a first taste of cars. Um, as you might imagine, this creates all sorts of problems. China lost its energy independence in the early 1990s. Uh, one of the, the kind of takeaways, uh, when I used to teach a 500,000-year uh, history of China in uh, 15 weeks, um, uh, one of the takeaways, you have to concentrate on a few themes, otherwise it's, it's all mystery. One of the takeaways from that course was, it's not just smarty pants, hindsight is 2020. oftentimes. People in the predicaments that they're in realize that they have really bad choices, right? When 50 years, when they look at all the disastrous things we've been up to, it won't be because we were totally caught off guard. Likewise, the same situation exists with cars. Chinese knew that if they went the car route, they would lose their energy independence and all sorts of problems would follow, uh, problems like them having to import uh, oil from uh, dodgy places, um, problems like them using lots of hard-earned uh, hard currency uh, for uh, energy, problems like the sort of pollution that now ravage uh, China. 
I predict the pretty obvious that because China has now committed cars, there'll be all sorts of international consequences of that in, in the scramble or competition for oil. It's pretty easy to imagine that that, um, that, that spill in the Gulf, uh, what if it were created by uh, Sinook, uh, Chinese, uh, big Chinese oil company, rather than BP? Imagine some Chinese head of state, instead of I'm going off yachting, remember how much we dislike that guy for let them eat cake while I go off and yachting? Imagine if you, you know, people projected their stereotypes of a Chinese person, that the head of that company maybe doesn't have perfect English, uh, and that then becomes a sort of embodiment of pure evil, who's the person who's despoiled our Gulf. I don't think you're going to have to imagine it for long. I think it's gonna, pretty obvious that the Chinese are going to be responsible for the same types of, of problems. Uh, they're already responsible for uh, getting their oil from, just like us, lots of places which maybe they ought not to, and supporting governments which maybe they ought not to. Likewise, acid rain already falls on a third of the country. There are hundreds of thousands of people. I now know, I, I think every Chinese friend I have knows somebody, so I'm only one person removed from somebody who feels like their premature death was directly associated with the pollution in China, much of it which is coming as a result of all the pollution created by, um, by cars. One of the solutions which we often hear touted uh, in this country, as well as in China, are EVs, electric vehicles. Uh, I say EV rather than electric cars because it includes both two-wheeled uh, uh, electric bicycles uh, as well as cars. Um, I think there's uh, many reasons uh, why China is going to push to EVs. Um, the, uh, if we pick three of those reasons, three important drivers why China is going to use its state capacity to try to push people into using electric vehicles, only the third of which would be that nasty pollution. The first two of which I would pick would be uh, uh, geopolitics. Uh, they don't want to keep getting oil from places which the US got there first. Uh, it's too expensive and too whatever, troublesome maybe they have, oh, uh, anyway. Uh, geopolitics of getting oil from tr threat, uh, difficult places. The second thing I'd put to, is, I, I would suggest is the reason for shifting to EVs is w one of the light motifs or underlying themes that I've been talking about is that Chinese concern with having a new round of economic growth. It's incre increasingly uncompetitive at the bottom end of the value chain. In other words, assembling shoes and bicycles and other sunset industry stuff is moving elsewhere. Uh, so you've got, to, you've got to move up the value chain. One of the places that I think that they want to move up the value chain is in electric vehicles. So you could say that there is a, uh, an economic rationale. Linked to that economic rationale for me, because I like to pull it all together, and probably so, and, uh, and w with this one theme, is political stability. Now how would political stability possibly fit into all of this? Um, I, 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 I remember a couple of decades ago when we were talking about NAFTA, one of the reasons why we signed on to a lot of these trade agreements was we were going to get rid of all the messy jobs and send them elsewhere. We would all be tele, uh, telecommuting from home, right, in the high-tech industry. Uh, well, somebody else did the you know, dirty work of manufacturing stuff. Uh, well, we moved up the value chain and left that bottom uncompetitive part to other parts of the global economy. The problem with that strategy that I've always found or contemplated is that lies on the assumption that the rest of the world wants to stay exactly at the bottom end of the value chain and that the Chinese won't take the same playbook of investing in education. So China has invested hugely, some would say over-invested in higher education, of, of massive numbers of college graduates from uh, the beginning of the reform period in the early um, 1980s, end of the 70s to today the number of college graduates has dramatically shot up. The problem is, if you have millions of college graduates and no middle or upper or, te or technologically um, dependent or, or jobs that you, you, didn't, you don't have apples, you don't have enough apples, uh, apple companies, then what do you do? So in my mind, the state push towards creating electric vehicle industry and trying to capture these new areas of the global economy are part, to me, linked to political stability. Because nothing is more problematic uh, for a government than millions of middle class kids whose parents are leveraged up to their necks in order to get them a higher education with the assumption that their kids are going to have a better life. They're not going to have to work in a factory or out in a rice paddies or whatever it is, that they're going to have uh, better opportunities. Uh, and that, that if the government doesn't supply those opportunities quickly enough, uh, then uh, political instability really takes off. We saw the same thing, I believe, in, the, in Tiananmen in 1989, uh, that 
that uh, there was a lot of disgruntlement about what, what opportunities were being created in the Ch in Chinese uh, economy and who those opportunities for, were for. And you see that same thing I mentioned briefly when I was talking about the new wealth in China and that those students that I talked to, that they felt like they've worked their tails off in order to get in the best universities, done well, but that's still blocked to them. Well, maybe part of the reason it's blocked to them is they're not creating those type of uh, jobs quickly enough. Maybe one last bit about what's, uh, what's, um, what gives us false hope in electric vehicles is, uh, you know, electricity, unfortunately, doesn't fall from the sky. Well, it, it does, but unfortunately, we don't uh, convert it at, at large enough scale. Most Chinese electricity is generated from coal, that same high polluting coal that's creating all that acid rain. So the idea that shifting to electric vehicles, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, again, has said it's virtually a wash that the electricity, at least right now, produced in this dirty state is not going to be the salvation to Chinese environmental reasons. But as I've sort of suggested to you, there are two other reasons more important to them, the geopolitics of it, the moving up the value chain, uh, partially for political stability, that explains why they're pushing towards EVs. And they are, uh, uh, the, the results for cars is still not very clear. Um, I think if you'd have most reporters in here, they would say hogwash, China, uh, EVs, they, have, they don't have the battery technology, they don't have the charging stations, they haven't figured out the basic things yet that keep people in, in, into electric vehicles. But I think that whole story of China's commitment to moving into internal combustion cars in the first place suggests when the sa state, assuming the Chinese state still has the strength, the capacity to do this, when it sees something as extremely important to the country, like moving people from internal combustion engines into EVs, it will use whatever resources it can to begin pushing in that direction. There are some indications that it's starting to do that. The grassroots uh, indications, though, the kind of bottom-up stuff is happening in the two-wheeled varieties, uh, the millions, tens of millions of electric vehicles that are popping up everywhere in China. I have to say it's quite maddening. Uh, if a, an analogous situation to bad haircut, good haircut would be bad Chinese bicycle that you could hear coming a mile away because it was so rickety to electric vehicles which sneak up on you. <laughs> I mean, I, I generally have trained myself to only look in the direction I need to look when I cross the street. Dangerous in England. <laughs> um, uh, and, but yes, EVs, I nearly get killed all of the time. So EVs uh, as a possible solution to all of this, I think it is a false hope, but I think we'll have it anyway. The, uh, um, as a final kind of things to contemplate in all of this um, is that the consumer market uh, it's not just a question of uh, being free, uh, free to choose whatever you want. The prices are not uh, simply determined by the market, but also these larger state objectives. I think particularly in America, where we fetishize free market as being the answer to everything, and imagine that China just moves in that direction, um, that all its problems will be solved, uh, we can see that that's slightly more complicated than that. Um, I also think that what I've tried to explain to you today is that the downsides of this move from China uh, towards a more consumer-driven economy and society means they're doubling down, doubling down for the planet uh, on an unsustainable uh, form of mobility, both in China and elsewhere, and that the way out that some of us like to contemplate in EVs won't resolve the problem. I think then uh, that these implications um, of shifts uh, of China's shift towards car has implications uh, not only for Chinese and the hundreds of thousands who are dying there, uh, but for the uh, rest of the planet as well. So yeah, it's a grim way to end, so I'll end a little bit happier by saying, look at me getting my hair cut in China a few years ago. On the one hand, when I talk about this stuff, I always like to acknowledge the kind of incredible hard work that the Chinese have made, uh, huge sacrifices in order to create such wonder, uh, splendiferous places to get your hair cut, uh, and all of the kind of nice aspects that that represents. I don't begrudge the Chinese for having wanting to have a Big Mac and French fries and a Coke and all, all those other things. I just think that we all should contemplate what example we've set for them and what example we've uh, pushed on them. So yeah, maybe your next car will be that. Uh, maybe our, our next world will be that. And because I didn't think ending on a grim note is a good idea, I said, maybe we'll adapt like this. <laughs> That's me rowing in Mission Bay. <laughs> uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to uh, your questions. <laughs>